Uh, thank you. Uh, next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 7505 in the name of Jamie Green on GP recruitment in West Kilbride and across Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Could I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Jamie Green to open the debate seven minutes or thereabouts, Mr Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, may I first of all thank uh, MSPs from across the Chamber uh, for supporting my motion uh, thus enabling today's very important debate. And from the outset, may I make it really clear the valued contribution that all frontline NH staff provide in the provision of healthcare in Scotland. Uh, Presiding Officer, West Kilbride GP surgery in North Ayrshire fell into crisis recently. In March of this year, two of its GPs announced uh, that they were leaving the practice. In August, the three remaining, remaining doctors took the sad and very regrettable decision to hand back their practice. The surgery is now under the control of the local health board and is being manned by locums. Since April this year, it has been operating on a on-the-day appointment system. Now, these uh, are known to be 2C practices, as they are called in the NHS, and they are thought to cost almost twice as much to run as a general practice. Now, in West Kilbride, adequate locum coverage is available until the end of November, but there are gaps in the December rota, and to date we have no detail has been provided as to what happens next year or indeed beyond. This has left many local residents feeling understandably distressed and worried. In the departing letter to local residents, the West Kilbride GPs noted, and I would like to quote from their letter, they said, there has not been sufficient support in the form of further doctors, and due to our significant concerns over the sustainability of continuing to deliver a safe and effective service, we took the serious step of handing back our general practice contract to the health board. That same letter closed with the following quite poignant words. They said, general practice can often be more than a job. It is hard for us to be leaving the families that we have been involved in over the past years. So may I therefore pay tribute to Drs. Struthers, Maxwell and Barber on behalf of the local community and thank them for their many years of service. But, presiding officer, this is a much wider problem. It is a problem across all of Scotland, and no doubt we're going to hear some stories from other members about that today. We know, presiding officer, that 52 practices have returned their GP contracts to health boards. Since 2007, the number of patients being treated in 2C practices across Scotland has jumped from 83,000 to 160,000 a spike of over 90%. Now, why is that important? Well, the knock-on effect is that our A&E and acute services have seen huge increases in demand as people struggle to get access to a GP. The GMB union described the ambulance service as at breaking point. Now, before any member of the government bench, and I know they are few and far between today, stands up and says to the chamber, that this is a problem in England and Wales too, then let me save you the bother. The provision of cradle-to-grave healthcare in Scotland has been devolved to this parliament for 20 years. The SNP has been in government for 10 of those years, and indeed the First Minister was in charge of health for five of those years. The situation today has been a long time coming. Let the statistics speak for themselves. It is a fact presiding officer, that general practice in Scotland receives a lowest share of NHS spend anywhere in the UK. It is a fact that more than a quarter of practices in Scotland have a GP vacancy. It is a fact that three quarters of those vacancies have been so for more than six months. 90% of GPs in Scotland think that their heavy workload is having a negative effect on the quality of care that they provide and just 7% think that 10-minute consultations are adequate. Now, the government might stand up today and mention the additional £250 million investment in general practice that it has promised, but it is vital that there is a commitment to recurring and sustained investment in primary care, and indeed a measurable plan on how it will address the recruitment problem. If they don't want to listen to me, they should listen to the experts. The BMA and the RCGP have provided many MSPs with detailed and constructive recommendations, which I urge the Minister to take into account. 
This problem did not happen overnight. Repeated warnings from across the board all pointed to the crisis we face today, a chronic underfunding of general practice and a training and recruitment pipeline which has not met demand. It is the perfect storm. Now, given that a third of GPs plan to retire within the next five years, today's crises will be tomorrow's disaster. There is a duty on this parliament to do more than just talk. There is a duty to act and there is a duty to listen. And it's a shame that the health minister herself is not here to listen. But act we must. Act we must. And now we must do it. The clock is ticking, presiding officer. I hope by bringing this debate to the parliament today, the government will focus its eyes once again on this crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Mr Gibson, Thank you, please. Presiding Officer, and let me first thank uh, Jamie Green on securing this debate and I express my concern in, at the way in which for weeks the Tories have repeated the same factually incorrect mantra about the future of West Kilbride medical practice, claiming it is set for closure and worrying my constituents. To this day, we hear that the practice may only stay open until Christmas, which is simply not true. Undoubtedly, the practice has been through a tough year with GP retirements and resignations, but let it be clear. At no point has NHS, Ayrshire and Arne ever indicated that the surgery will close. Quite the contrary. I've always been reassured that the health board wouldn't dream of leaving West Kilbride without a surgery, and closure was and is simply not an option. Indeed, all other practice staff remain in place, and the practice manager reports that patients have been very understanding of recent changes. The level of pharmacy input into the practice has also been enhanced through the SNP government's investment in primary care. I was reassured by primary care development support manager Karen Grant that at least two locum GPs are enjoying working at the practice so much they hope to stay at least another six months and might become salaried. Locum staffing is not ideal for continuity of care and work is ongoing to establish longer term commitments to the practice. Ms Grant also welcomes a 250 million incremental investment in primary care from the SNP government enabling investment in multidisciplinary teams around practice with three doctors on most days, sometimes two, and today, four. The West Kilbride surgery is now better staffed than for a long time. I commend practice staff, our local health and social care partnership, and NHS Ayrshire and Arne for their work in West Kilbride. And I thank them for their tireless efforts in utilising SNP government initiatives such as the Scottish Rural Medicine Collaborative and attracting doctors to the practice. These professionals must be sick of hearing that, that what they are doing isn't good enough, regardless of what we may have heard earlier this evening. Officer, at some point, the incessant stream of misinformation about the practice was so bad that several constituents asked me which surgery should go to now that the one in West Kilbride has closed down. In late August, I felt compelled to issue letters to inform every single West Kilbride household of the real situation. And this brings me to the utter hypocrisy of Tory politicians presenting themselves as knights in shining armour galloping to the rescue of patients in West Kilbride. Their party has cut Scotland's budget by 9% with more to come. Yet they stand up in this chamber demanding the SNP government does more with less. Meanwhile, their stewardship in England invites no faith in the Tory approach. In January, the British Red Cross declared a humanitarian crisis was taking place in England's NHS, where junior doctors took, uh, strikes took place not long ago. The Financial Times revealed that GPs are leaving NHS England at a rate of more than 400 a month with an estimated shortage of 12,100 by 2020. Recruitment agencies could be paid over 100 million with English NHS to find GPs to replace the 5,159 they left last year, with half of those replacements being sought overseas. I wonder what impact the Tory government uh, thinks its isolationist Brexit rhetoric will have on attracting those doctors. Meanwhile, the SNP government is working with Scottish health boards to train, recruit and retain GPs. At one GP per 1,100 people, compared with one for every 1,380 in Tory England, 1,378 in Labour Wales and 1,436 in Northern Ireland, Scotland still has the best GP coverage per head of population in the UK by far. Measures to attract more include a 71.6 million investment in direct support of general practice, activities to attract junior doctors and qualified GPs to work in general practice, including a GP returners programme, the Scottish International Medical Training Fellowship programme, widened access to medical education and so on. 
The SNP Government is committed to providing an extra £250 million annually in direct support for general practice by 2021, increasing overall primary care investment by £500 million. The GP Recruitment Retention Fund increases this year from £1 to £5 million, enabling expansion and continued support to existing and new initiatives across Scotland. British Medical Association Scottish GP Committee Chair Dr Alan McDevitt welcomed this as, and I quote, a very positive step in the right direction towards our shared vision of general practice. I'm sorry, Lee. Presiding officer, I trust that I've clarified what is really going on in West Kilbride medical practice and have every faith in a healthy future at West Kilbride. It was never up for closure, nor will it be. Thank you. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Alison Johnson. Mr Briggs, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by congratulating my colleague Jamie Green for securing today's debate and for the good work he is doing in representing the concerns of residents in West Kilbride and about the future of their local surgery. It is entirely right that he is bringing these serious issues to our Parliament and to the attentions of Ministers to get today. The GP recruitment crisis is one of the biggest challenges facing our NHS and every MSP in this chamber will be acutely aware of the pressures on their local GP services in constituencies and regions across our country. And as the motion correctly identifies, the Royal College of GPs Scotland warned in a submission to the Health and Sport Committee this summer that Scotland is facing a shortfall of 828 GPs across Scotland by 2021. Just this week they have updated that figure and that shortage is now standing at a projected 856 by 2021. RCGP was highly critical of the Scottish Government and the impression it gave that an extra £500 million would be invested directly into GPs by 2021, when the actual real figure is half of that, which is being invested, with the rest being invested in primary care. And it stated starkly, and I quote, if the long-standing underfunding and confusion that we are currently experiencing is to continue, we'll keep witnessing a considerable number of general practices closing and transferring the running of their practices to health boards due to the insuff insufficient resource through which it to remain solvent. Patients will continue to be found queuing outside practices for the uncertain opportunity merely to register with a GP. And ministers need to heed these warnings and act urgently. Jamie Green's motion refers to the problems in my own Lothian region, and these are significant in a part of Scotland where the population is rising fast and consequently demand for primary care services is increasing dramatically. Within NHS Lothian, over 40% of GP practices are either full or not accepting new patients and are restricting registration. That is the crisis we face, Mr Gibson, in Scotland and something I hope members across this chamber will start to recognise. Patients regularly contact me to explain about the difficulty in securing non-emergency GP appointments, as Jamie Green has identified. The situation here in the capital is particularly serious. A report on the future GP provision of premises um, required that over the next few years um, it will be considered um, by the GP practice um, by IJB in Edinburgh on Friday again contained serious warnings about the pressure on local services as the capital prepares for an additional 55,000 people to live here by October 2026. Since 2009, the GP list size in Edinburgh has been growing at approximately 5,000 a year, the equivalent of a new GP practice annually. The report states that while primary care has been very flexible in absorbing this new population, this elasticity is now exhausted in most areas of the capital. It's clear that significant investment is indeed needed in new and expanding GP practices across Edinburgh and across Scotland if we are to avoid a meltdown in GP services, which would lead to additional pressures on our emergency and acute health services. The Scottish Government have known about this GP recruitment crisis and the demographic challenges which are facing many GPs for years now and the consequence of its failure to do more in terms of the National Workforce Plan are a concern to all of us across Scotland. I acknowledge the Scottish Government is taking forward a new graduate entry medical course and I've welcomed elements of that, especially the bonding which will hopefully make sure that students in due course take up, who take up bursaries will in fact return to service in NHS Scotland. But a huge concern remains for me. Members just closing. Time, sorry. But a huge concern, and this might answer the Minister's point, remains the fact that a percentage of Scottish domiciled students studying clinical medicine in Scotland, those most likely to stay and work in our NHS after they've graduated, has now fallen sharply under this government from two thirds in 1999 to just over half this year because of an effective cap on the number of Scots able uh, to study medicine. Close. 
To conclude, presiding officer, I again welcome today's debate and the opportunity to talk about this critically important subject. Scottish Conservatives will continue to press the government and never shy of bringing these issues to our Parliament as we work to see an investment in our GP sector. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Call Alison Johnson to be followed by Colin Smith. Ms Johnson, please. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and my apologies to the Chamber in advance, as I will have to leave before the conclusion of the debate. Um, I thank Jamie Green for bringing this important matter to the Chamber this evening. Um, I and my Lothian colleague, Andy Whiteman, have been alarmed by the number of constituents contacting us because they can't see their GP, whether they can't register on a list or simply are unable to get an appointment. In Lothian, as Miles Briggs has pointed out, like many parts of the country, constituents have been very severely affected by this issue, from Musselburgh in the east to Ratho in the west, and in practices at Bangham, Kirkliston and Leithlinks, challenges have been faced. And not only, as we've heard when making an appointment to see a GP, I've heard from constituents who've had to queue up on certain days at certain times just for a chance to register with a GP. And this is, of course, the very last thing that our GPs want. But last year, Dr Elaine McNaughton from the Royal College of GPs told the Health and Sport Committee that professionals, and I'm quoting, have spent 10 years highlighting the retirement bulge. The government has been too slow to listen, and now the effects on patients are becoming all too clear, and the effects on GPs themselves. And worryingly, as today's motion notes, the Royal College of General Practitioners estimates that there could be a shortfall of 828 GPs across Scotland within the next few years. Now, I bear in mind that the Scottish Government has taken recent action to improve access to careers in medicine, particularly the new Graduate School of Medicine, which will help to embed students within a primary care training pathway and facilitate their placements in remote and rural regions. But I do worry that some of these steps have simply come too late. And I was concerned to see that the Scottish Government's health and social care workforce plans haven't yet comprehensively addressed general practice. I welcome recent action the government has taken to improve access to careers in medicines, but there is much more to do, and I'm not sure that steps taken, such as the new GP training bursary, have really seen a significant impact on recruitment yet. I'm particularly concerned about the impact that this GP recruitment and retention crisis will have on patients living and GPs working in our most deprived areas. Analysis already shows that GPs practicing in the most deprived areas of Scotland typically manage larger lists and they have more patients with multiple health conditions including mental health needs. Yet last year it seemed that GP practices in the most deprived 20% of postcodes received £1.34 less per patient than practices in the least deprived. Presiding officer, the shortage of GPs has terrible knock-on effects for the rest of our NHS services in terms of unscheduled hospital admissions and deepening health inequalities. I firmly believe that we still don't place enough real emphasis on preventative health and anticipatory care begins in general practice. Just last month, I was able to visit the Edinburgh Access Practice to learn more about the fantastic outreach work they do to treat hepatitis C. The ability to lead outreach work and tackle unmet need if we don't protect and enhance funding for general practice will be sorely diminished. I've called for fairer funding for GPs in deprived areas. I fully agree that GPs across the country are stretched and stressed. The demands of working with elderly populations are very high. Working in remote and rural areas is challenging too. But our young people in the most deprived areas of Scotland mustn't lose out as a result, as this will have long-term consequences, ensuring that GP funding reflects the need to tackle health inequalities and ring-fencing some of that funding for practice development would go a long way to redressing this historical imbalance. And initiatives like the Governship Project show what can be achieved with a little additional support and funding to give patients with complex needs longer appointment times. And I believe this way of working may have cross-party support. Presiding officer, we must work smartly to make our GP workload sustainable. We must do all that we can to attract, retain and recruit GPs. Scotland badly needs them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Colin Smith to be followed by Tavish Scott. Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to Jamie Green for his motion, which has provided the opportunity to debate the GP crisis in Ayrshire, but also right across Scotland. GP practices are not only at the heart of our NHS, they are very much at the heart of our local communities. 
as many as 90 per cent of patient interactions are with primary care, and for many, GPs are that vital first point of contact in our health care system. But a decade of cuts to the share of NHS spending being made for GP services and to training places by the Scottish Government has left that point of contract at breaking point in far too many of our communities. It is estimated that there are currently 171 GP vacancies in Scotland, 73 per cent of which have been open for more than six months. Right now, a practice has been forced to close almost every month, and a total of 14 practices have closed since 2016. In many communities, the situation is stark. Jamie Green rightly highlighted the particular problems facing in North Ayrshire and also NHS Lothian. In my own home region of Dumfries and Galloway, the number of GPs has fallen from 134 in 2012 to 118 in 2016. Villages such as Warnlock Head have lost their outreach surgery because of a shortage of GPs in the Moffat area who provided that service. And admissions to Thornhill Hospital were closed because the local GP practice that provides the cover at the hospital could not fill vacancies in their practice. And it's not alone. 42 per cent of practices in the region have a vacancy, 16 posts largely unfilled for six months. NHS Dumfries and Galloway have already had to take over the running of two GP practices with that number set to rise. And the reality is, President Officer, this problem is set to get worse. 26 GPs in Dumfries and Galloway are aged over 55 and therefore likely to retire within the next five years. And as a result of Brexit, the number of applications for health posts in the region from the EU has all but dried up. It's frankly a ticking time bomb, a crisis happening on the watch of this government. But a crisis the government should have seen coming. In 2008, Audit Scotland called on the Scottish Government to collect comprehensive data on GP and GB practice staff numbers to support proper workforce planning. And in 2014, the Royal College of GPs warned that underfunded of GPs was putting patients at risk. Yet by 2015-16, the proportion of NHS spending allocated to GP services was at an all-time low. After 10 years of ineffective action and countless ignored warnings, tackling the GP crisis in the short term will not be easy, not least because the current shortage is adding to the workload of those GPs that remain impacting further on recruitment, but it's also impacting on patient care. A recent BMA survey revealed that 91% of responding GPs said they felt the quality of care their patients receive has been negatively affected as a result of their growing workload. So, President Officer, urgent action is needed. Professional bodies across the primary care sector support a move towards a multidisciplinary approach in GP practices to take the, the pressure off GPs, providing, of course, that the crucial key role of GP is protected. But such moves are simply not happening quick enough, and Audit Scotland have rightly called on the Scottish Government to, quote, provide strong leadership by providing a clear framework to guide local development. There are also clear examples of successful models such as the, the Govan Ship project mentioned by Alison Johnston that show if general practice is properly funded, major benefits can be achieved for patients, GP workload and in recruitment and retention. And presiding officer, funding is the key, whether that's in a proper high profile recruitment campaign which reaches beyond the EU or increasing the share of funding for general practice, which has fallen from 9.27% in 2006 7 to just 7.2% in 2015-16. It would therefore be helpful today if the Minister can tell members when summing up whether the Government does intend to ensure that 11 per cent of the total NHS budget will go to general practice and deliver the improvements in services for patients, reduce strain on our GPs and help make the profession an attractive choice of career for medical students once again. Without fairer funding, there is no doubt the GP crisis we face will continue. Thank you. Thank you. I call Tavish Scott to be followed by Graham Simpson. Mr Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Jamie Green is right in his opening remarks that this is not just a uh, situation in uh, West Kilbride, but right across uh, Scotland. Crisis is a much used word in politics, but Colin Smith's uh, figures uh, and many other members across the chamber uh, d do illustrate why this uh, is indeed exactly uh, that. Uh, learned bodies who represent uh, GPs, uh, organisations who represent carers, uh, and anyone who looks at the NHS budget and the consequences uh, of the squeeze that's now taking place uh, know that that crisis is hitting uh, constituents the length and breadth 
of Scotland. And Colin Smith was right to point out to that 2008 report. I remember reading that at that time as well. Uh, and it made very clear recommendations to the government. And it would pose some good parliamentary questions as to what happened to, that, uh, to those recommendations and why they haven't been followed, because discernibly they have not. The biggest change has been the move that has been published in the papers today on the last couple of days from, away from independent practices to salaried practices. Uh, that is now the reality for an awful lot of uh, the delivery primary care right across uh, Scotland. And don't believe that salaried practices always work. In Lerwick this morning, uh, like too many mornings at the moment, under uh, the, the, the salary practice that is now the Lerwick Health Centre, people queued at 8.30 a.m. to get an appointment. Now, there is nothing good about that. There is nothing working about that model. And yet that is the reality in too many parts of Scotland, as Alison Johnson clearly indicated uh, here in the capital city uh, as well. So the government do have some big questions to answer. And here's why. Because the health boards are a creature of the government. This idea that they are an independent part of the process is complete nonsense. Uh, health, boards, health board chairs and health board chief executives are told to jump by the Minister of the Day. And it happened under the government I was in as well. I see Alec Neil, former health secretary there. He knows how this system uh, works. And I'm not making a political point about the current government. I'm just saying that is the system we have had since devolution. And demonstrably, it is not working. If ever there was a system that needed change and reform, it is the system of health boards. Uh, Jamie uh, Green rightly mentioned locums. Shuttle Health Board spending £1.3 million on locums in the current financial year. Eight out of our ten practices are now salaried. Eight out of ten. There are, uh, eight, in eight of those practices, uh, we are one GP short or more. Uh, that is the reality of the uh, problems that now exist in one part of Scotland. Uh, I'm just finish this point, and no doubt uh, much more so in different parts as well. Happy to give away. Jamie Green. Thank uh, the member for taking intervention. I think what strikes me from the debate today is just the sheer geographic scale of this. And far from local scaremongering, we wouldn't agree that this is a crisis throughout Scotland and is absolutely uh, aside from party politics. Tabby Scott. The, uh, that, is, that is the case, and uh, I hope in that sense the government will treat it uh, with all the seriousness that it should, given the range uh, uh, across Parliament of parliamentary views on this. I have a number of questions as well I'd like to pose to the Minister I hope she'll deal with in the wind-up. Is the government's policy to, still to support single GP practices? Because in Shetland, our health board has just issued a letter to patients saying it's the NHS Scotland's policy not to support single GP practices. So I hope the Minister will set that out very clearly in her wind-up. I'd also like her to deal with dispensing practices because many GP practices across Scotland benefited from being dispensing as well. Uh, most health boards have taken that away. Indeed, in Shetland, when Walls of Yale and Unce ceased to be an independent practice and became salaried, the health board removed the dispensing functions. Now, when Alec Neil was uh, health secretary, I raised this, as indeed many members raised it across the chamber, including his own party, about that requirement. Uh, yet the health boards, the health boards are the ones that appear to me to be removing those dispensing abilities and that has a significant financial impact uh, on the practice. Two final questions, presiding officer. Um, firstly, I hope in terms of GP referrals, Maureen Watt, who represents the North East, will tell us what is going on in Grampian when people in my constituency are now being referred to Newcastle for cardiology uh, when uh, that service used to be able to obviously be uh, available at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And lastly, the BMA ran a sensible proposal this uh, summer, so a sensible rather pro uh, program this summer to encourage all of us to visit GP practice in our areas. Uh, I certainly did that at home. Uh, these are incredibly valued uh, staff, not just the, the GPs themselves, but the practice nurses and others who work in these practices. It's time the government recognised the pressure these people are under, put the money in to support them, and also answer some fundamental questions about what model, model of primary care the government wants for the future. Thank you, Mr Scott. I call Graham Simpson to be followed by Alec Neil. Mr Simpson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I also uh, thank Jamie Green for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber. Um, members uh, across the Chamber have highlighted the scale of the crisis throughout Scotland. I want to focus uh, in the next few moments uh, on something that Tavish Scott mentioned, uh, and that is the issue of uh, locum GPs. Um, because when we have a GP crisis, uh, the cost of locums goes up, and that's uh, certainly what's been happening throughout the country. Um, in my area, uh, Lanarkshire, um, I've been passed letters uh, written by two GP practices, uh, and I just want to read out passages uh, from those letters. Uh, one um, actually starts off 
um, it calls itself, it says there's a cry for help from GP practices. It says we are rapidly reaching a crisis point with trying to provide adequate GP locum cover. Uh, trying to find locum GP cover for existing GPs uh, already in place in general practice is becoming a major issue. And it seems, according to this letter, that locums have discovered their rarity to be a valid reason to try and hold GP practices to ransom. Um, it goes on to say that most of us would usually pay between 230 to 260 pounds per three hour session for a GP locum cover and uh, up to 500 pounds for a full day. Uh, that has recently increased to up to 800 pounds a day, quite a rise. Uh, along with this is the demand that locums will not do extra duties, i.e. home visits, signing prescriptions, etc. You, you really wouldn't uh, believe it, would you? Um, it says it's incredibly time, consu time consuming and frustrating. It goes on to relate um, a couple of instances uh, of what locums uh, have asked for, 650 pounds per day to see no more than 30 patients with no additional duties. Uh, another one charged 764 pounds per day to see no more than 24 patients with the cost of return flight from their home in the Isle of Man to be paid and to be picked up and returned from the airport. Quite unbelievable, isn't it? Um, another practice, a different practice, uh, talks about the crisis in locum recruitment, uh, calls it a source of stress and frustration, talks about the spiraling financial demands of locums, of refusing to undertake duties, other than seeing the requisite number of patients in the clinic, therefore no house calls, no routine script signing, no emergencies, no results commenting, no handling of any correspondence. If that's not a crisis, I don't know what is. Um, it calls this situation unjust and morally unfair. And it goes on to say, the situation is now intolerable and unsustainable with many practices having to reduce their patient facing time to avoid prejudicing the quality of the consultation. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think that situation is completely unacceptable. And if the Minister cannot answer and cannot say what she and her government are going to do about that, then that is a disgrace. Uh, thank you. I call Alec Neil, last speaker in the open debate. Mr Neil. Thank you very much indeed, the Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I can speak for hours on this, having been a Health Secretary. I welcome this debate. I think it's good to have an open debate about this. Mm -hmm. But rather than try and cover every single point, I want to emphasise two or three issues which have not really so far been highlighted in this debate. I think inevitably we all recognise the challenges there are, not just in terms of the shortage of GPs, which is a, a worldwide shortage, but a worldwide shortage of doctors. I mean, one of the consequences of Obamacare, for example, is that the United States of America has had to recruit nearly 20,000 additional doctors to cater for the additional demand created by Obamacare, and sometimes that has a knock-on impact on the destinations of medical graduates from the United Kingdom. So there's a whole range of issues that have influenced this matter. But there are two strategic issues in particular I want to raise by way of looking forward to try and find a solution to the problem rather than just continually reiterate the nature of the problem. And these two issues I don't think have been given enough attention uh, either in this debate or more generally. Uh, the first one is we're just simply not admitting enough young people to medical school in Scotland. Uh, in fact, in some of our universities, and Miles Briggs referred to this briefly, uh, less than half of the medical students are actually from Scotland. Now, that's not a nationalist point. It's a medical health policy point because there is clear evidence that those medical students who come from a particular country like Scotland, when they graduate, most of them decide to practice in Scotland. Indeed, it goes further. There is clear evidence if you take more students in from rural and island areas, they may not return to their own rural and island area, but they will return to a rural or island area. 
And one of the things Mike Russell and I did when Mike was the education secretary was increase the number, deliberately, the number of students, medical students, gaining entry from rural and island areas. Now that doesn't pay off for five to 10 years until these people complete their education. But as well as dealing with some of the immediate issues, we need to also look at the strategic issues. And one of the strategic challenges is to substantially increase the intake of medical students. Now the BME have resisted that in the past on the grounds they don't want to see any unemployed doctor. Given the exponential increase on the need and the need for doctors, not just GPs but all kinds of doctors, the chances of any good doctor being unemployed are practically zilch. So that's not a good enough reason to resist a substantial increase in the intake of medical students. The other strategic point I would make is this, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I don't think people realise the impact this has had. Uh, up until 2010, medics, like many other people in the economy, were entitled to build up a private pension pot that was tax-free of 1.8 million. Uh, George Osborne reduced that, first of all, to 1.5, then 1.25, and more recently to 1 million pounds. Now, most people would think a tax-free pension pot of a million pounds is a, a very substantial amount of money. But for senior doctors and GPs, it is a one million pound pot is the equivalent, or you build that up, if you put the maximum contribution allowed in, that builds up to over 25 years. Within 25 years of your working life, you reach the top of the million pound pot. When it was 1.8 million, you had to work 38 years at the maximum contribution in order to do that. And if you speak to doctors, they will tell you two things. Number one, the reason why so many are retiring in their 50s, which is a major contributing factor to the situation we find ourselves in, is because the pension policy now acts as a disincentive to continue to work full time until anything near the normal pension age. And secondly, and I'll finish on this, presiding officer, there's also a specific effect. I remember when this was introduced, there was almost immediately a 40% reduction in Glasgow alone of GPs prepared to do out of hours because the more out of hours they did, the earlier they would have to retire in order to gain the maximum benefit from their pension. And so there, we, no, there you must conclude. Fascinating so and involved. We have to address is. that issue, Presiding Officer. Thank you very Part much. Part of the problem. Uh, and I close please, on uh, Maureen Watt to close for the Government Minister. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the opportunity today to respond to this important subject raised by Jamie Green. And I thank all members who have participated and for the issues raised. MSPs of every party, as with the general public, recognise the great work that is done by our health professionals across NHS Scotland. And I welcome that and we share it. Colin Smith said that GP practices are at the heart of our communities and they are at the heart of our NHS. And that's why in March, the Cabinet Secretary announced that funding in direct support of general practice will increase by 250 million by the end of this parliament as part of our commitment to increase primary and community care funding by 500 million. This game-changing investment in primary care will deliver multidisciplinary teams offering patient access to the right professional at the right time, and it will support GPs to do their job. But we're far from complacent. Even with the increases in the numbers of GPs under this government, up 6.9%, that's 315 since 2006, we recognise that healthcare must adapt to meet the changing needs of the people in Scotland. And we're fully aware of the challenges of recruitment and retention for GPs in some areas. And we're taking action on multiple fronts to address them. Our long-term national workforce plan is helping to identify and address the key issues for every part of the workforce. Alison Johnson wanted to know about primary care in that regard, and that is in part three of our plan, and that will be published following the conclusion of GP contract negotiations. And we've heard about the specific situation with the West Kilbride practice. 
I know that during this period of uncertainty, Ayrshire and Allen Arran Health Board have enhanced the level of pharmacy input into the practice thanks to the investment in the multidisciplinary team uh, from the Scottish Government. And Kenny Gibson was right to uh, write to all his, his residents in West Kilbride to uh, reassure them of the commitment of Ayrshire, not only Ayrshire and Arran Health Board, but also the Government. And with regards to NHS Lothian list restrictions, the board has indicated that this is only a temporary measure. And I'm confident that patient safety is always the top priority. And we'll continue to work with all boards to ensure our investment delivers better care, better services and better value. Kenny Gibson is right to highlight all the factors, and as did Alec Neil, leading to the current uh, situation, many of which are out with our control, such as the pensions. That pension, that's a real problem, the pension uh, problem that Alec Neil was right to highlight it because he first encountered it when he was working in the health. And for the, uh, for the opposition Tory bench to, dis to dismiss Brexit is absolutely disgraceful. We know that people from the, that will have a direct effect on the Scottish workforce. And people who, from the EU who choose to live here, including doctors, nurses and others providing health care, are welcome in Scotland, as the First Minister has made clear. And it would be disastrous if the uncertainties... Well, already we know that the uncertainty is, is uh, making people decide not to come and live and work in here in Scotland and also to leave. So that is a real problem. But we are addressing, presiding officer, the day-to-day -day challenges GPs tell us they face. Two years ago, we were the first country in the UK to remove the bureaucratic tick box quality and outcomes framework. Instead, our GPs are working together to make services better. And we're working hard with the BME at the moment to deliver a new GP contract, which will see our GPs focusing more on the challenging work they have trained to do, supported by a bigger multidisciplinary team. Yes. Colin Smith. On chat, um, the Minister, I, I specifically asked during my contribution if the government were committed to delivering 11% um, of the NHS budget to, to GPs. It was actually Dr Philippa Whiteford that told uh, Pulse magazine on the 24th of May 2017 the GP contract is currently under negotiation but the Scottish Government has committed to reversing the decline in the share of the health budget that general practice has had and bring it up to 11% by the end of Parliament. Is that the case? Minister. We are committed to bringing the uh, proportion of the NH budget up to uh, 11 uh, percent and the GP contract, as a member knows, is currently under negotiation. It would be wrong to go into any detail with regard to that. But we are working hard with the BMA at the moment to deliver a new GP contract, which will see our GPs focusing more on the challenging work that they've trained for, as I said, with the bigger multidisciplinary team. And we've increased funding fivefold for the GP recruitment and retention this year to five to 5 million, and that's part of the overall 71.6 million package of investment this year in direct support to general practice. Tavi Scott. Minister, she has talked about multidisciplinary medical teams a number of times in her speech. How do those fit into single GP practices in rural areas? Well, Minister. I think the, the member did ask me about uh, single uh, GP practices, um, and I think it's up to, I mean, the member mentioned health boards, and it is up to health boards to take government policy, as he knows, and deliver it according to the needs of their local populations. Um, and across, uh, GP, uh, across the country, we are seeing GP practices and multidisciplinary teams working together to uh, give patients the access to the right person um, at the right time. But I will, get, I will make sure um, that the, the particular question um, about single GP practices um, Can is I ask the Minister to, yes, to is speak into the microphone? To, Thank you. Is replied to by uh, the member. The member will also know that in relation to his query about dispensing practices, that was a trend taking place long before uh, this government uh, took office. Uh, can I continue by saying that um, not only are we uh, working with the BME in terms of the new contract, but we are also increasing the numbers uh, that Alec Neil mentioned about young GPs coming through the pipeline. 
and to increase supply and widen access, we're investing 23 million into a medical education package. It includes an increase of 50 medical undergraduate places from 2016-17, a pre-medical entry programme to commencing ap academic year 2017-18, and the establishment of Scotland's first graduate entry medical programme called ScotGen, which is commencing in 2018-19. And these programmes, particularly the pre-medical entry programme, specifically addresses the, pro the point that Alec Neil made about getting people from, less dis from more disadvantaged backgrounds and from our rural areas into medicine and these are precisely the people that are more likely uh, to stay and return to uh, those rural areas. We've also heard today about concerns about board run practices and as of the 1st of July 2017 out of the 959 practices throughout Scotland there were only 57 practices directly run by NHS boards rather than as independent businesses. And sometimes this is the best solution for a local area. Sometimes the practices will return to independent contracting. The point is that patients will always be able to see a GP, regardless of whether it's an independent business or whether it's run under the 2C practice. And it's the safety of patients which is always the highest priority. In conclusion, presiding officer, we're committed to primary care and to GPs who do a difficult job, but do it well. As the needs of our population change, so too will our primary care services, as we shift the balance of care towards the community. We're investing a huge, huge 71.6 million in direct support of general practice this year, and it will be 250 million by the end of the parliament. But we know we've more to do. We work on the GP contract and our investment in GP recruitment and retention, and that is ongoing, supported by our primary care investment. We want everyone involved in primary care to get behind our vision for the future of primary care, to help make it a reality. And I trust all MSPs from all parties want that to happen too. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate, and I close this meeting of Parliament.